I also want to mention an alternate version of it or a variation of it, because this will lead us into another important hardness assumption, which is the sparse LPN problem. So in the sparse LPN problem, you fix a very small constant k, like maybe three or five. And now when the learning algorithm asks for a noisy equation, you don't pick, you know, the, the secret holder does not pick all a1 through an uniformly at random, which would have the property that about half of the a's would be one and half the a's would be zero. Instead, they just pick exactly k uh, ai's to be one. Okay, so basically, uh, you know, if k is three, then they pick three numbers between uh, one and n, and they give you a noisy equation. Let's call those numbers i1, i2, a3. Those are chosen randomly between one and n. And then you learn, you know, you get an equation that looks like xi1 plus xi2 plus xi3 equals b mod 2. And you're given the correct right-hand side with probability 1 minus epsilon and the wrong right-hand side with probability uh, epsilon. So this definitely makes your task easier because you're getting like a lot more, intuitively, you're getting a lot more information about the secret string with each noisy equation. And in fact, let me uh, make that even clearer. Let's say you're a polynomial time algorithm and we let you get M noisy equations that look like this, these sparse equations. First of all, imagine m is like noticeably bigger than n to the k. So in, in your mind for this discussion, fix k to be 3. And say you're a polynomial time algorithm and you're allowed to take like way more than n cubed algorithm, uh, n cubed equations, like n to the fourth equations. Well, there's only n to the k or so many possible left-hand sides, like n choose k left-hand sides, uh, n choose three left-hand sides. So if you're allowed to take, you know, way more than n cubed uh, samples, You'll get like you'll see the same left hand side like many many times like you'll see like x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals one or zero like lots and lots of times and you'll be able to figure out what is the correct right hand side because you know like one minus epsilon of the time when you see x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals something you know you'll see the same value for that something be it zero or one and only epsilon of the time will you see the opposite value so you'll basically be able to get rid of the noise yourself and get back to the case of like non-noisy equations with high probability, and then you can solve them with Gaussian elimination. So this shows that you can, you can solve the problem if you're given sufficiently large polynomial number of equations, like n to the k. Uh, in fact, this one is not as easy to see, but it's known that you can even do this if you're allowed to take like n to the k over two samples. Okay, this is you know not as easy. This uses a semi-definite programming algorithm, um, kind of this is based on work of Feige and Ofek and Applebaum. Uh, so there's that, but this is like the best thing that's known. And so, for example, you know if you can fix k to be three, then you might say, well, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to let you take n to the 1.5 equations, noisy equations. I'm only going to give you big O of n equations. Then it could be hard. So this is a possible assumption that if you're a polynomial time algorithm and I'm only giving you like order n equations, which is information theoretically enough for you to solve the problem in exponential time, uh, as it turns out, uh, you can assume that there's no polynomial time algorithm that can solve this task, even when k is three. And in fact, uh, this task could actually even be way harder um, for example, we don't know how to solve this task in time better than 2 to the n over log n, like 2 to the little of n over log n. And uh, we don't even know how to solve this problem if, like, you don't even have to find s. You just have to sort of tell the difference, like, am I really getting, like, you know, 99.99% accurate equations about a fixed string s? Or is, you know, the person just feeding me pure junk? Or by pure junk, I mean, imagine you take epsilon to be a half. So that means like the right-hand side is just randomized. So it's like you get completely meaningless equations. So it's like actually an easier task to just tell the difference between are you getting completely meaningless equations or are you actually getting like 99.99% accurate equations? Um, even this is not known to be doable. And this is pretty cool because it's like, this is an example of like a, a problem where it's really easy, like in three lines of computer code, you can generate 
hard seeming puzzles. Like you just write code that like picks a random string s, it picks m equals order n three tuples of indices, and you know it, it writes down the associated true equation, then it flips to each right hand side with probability one percent, and it produces a bunch of like noisy equations. And then you know you give it off to an algorithm and say here's like you know 100 n noisy equations about a random string s. Each one involves only three variables on the left hand side. Please try to find s. Nobody knows how to do this in less less than two to the n over log n time. And you know it's like a five line piece of code for generating like a cool puzzle. <clears throat> in fact, a cool puzzle where you, the code generator, or the algorithm that generates this puzzle, it knows the secret. It, it picked the secret s itself. So that's a very useful primitive. And in fact, this will let me transition into talking about worst case hard problems for a while. So in fact, the worst case version of this sparse LPN uh, with k equals 3 is actually provably known to be hard. Well, as always in this world, we don't know how to prove anything is hard. So when I say like provably hard, I mean assuming our most basic 50-year-old assumption that we always take p does not equal np. So let me transition to talking about that, but feel free to add any uh, questions in the chat if you have them. Right, so what's this um, worst case version of the theorem, a problem? So uh, in 1999, Hosta proved the following uh, quite famous theorem. It's about the NP hardness of a certain CSP task. And the CSP is like the 3XOR CSP. And it's exactly this sort of thing that we've been talking about. Like there are N unknown you know, values, X1 through XN, and you're supposed to assign them value zero, one, mod two. And each constraint is like a linear equation, mod two, that involves exactly three of them. And that's exactly what we were talking about on the last hand side, last time. Uh, but before we talked about, you know, picking the solution at random and like the right hand side would be like correct, but with some noise. And here's just a worst case problem. And you're trying to find the solution or the assignment to the X's that satisfies as many of the equations as you can. And Hostad's theorem is the following. Um, even if I give you an instance, basically it's hard to tell the difference between like a 99% satisfiable so system and a merely 51% satisfiable system. Or like even if I give you a system where there is like an, a, a solution that satisfies 99% of the equations, it's hard to find a solution satisfying 51% of the equations. Um, and that's NP hard in the worst case. So it's sort of, you know, definitely hard assuming P does not equal NP. And let me just sort of remind you what that looks like. I mean, Hostad's theorem can be viewed. I mean, if you put together the entire proof of Hostad's theorem, like maybe it's 200 pages, but well, 100 at the pages. Um, it's a very long NP completeness reduction, NP hardness reduction. Like ultimately he creates a polynomial time reduction R, he takes his input like a CNF, three CNF formula phi, and it outputs, you know, a system of equations I, and he proves the theorem that like, okay, this reduction has the property that if phi is satisfiable, then there will be a solution to these equations that satisfies 99% of them. And if phi is unsatisfiable, then every solution satisfies at most, you know, 51% of them. And just uh, to remind you why these, you know, two quantities like 99% and 51% are relevant, um, you know, if you're given a system where 100% of the equations can be satisfied by some assignment, then there's a simple polynomial time algorithm that finds such a solution that's solving a system of satisfiable equations. It's Gaussian elimination. On the other hand, there's always like a super simple algorithm that will satisfy 50% of the equations. Uh, in particular, you can just look at the right-hand sides, and if there's more ones than zeros, then use the assignment that sets all the variables to one. And then whenever you have a right-hand side of one, you satisfy that assignment. And if there's more zeros than ones, set all the variables to zero, and you satisfy every equation with a zero on the right-hand side. So one of these is at least 50% of the equations. Okay, so uh, that's Hostad's theorem. And as I mentioned, you know, if you really dig into this reduction, it's extremely long. I mean, it built on, I don't know, something like eight years worth of effort in complexity theory. So really it divides into like several steps, like there's a reduction from three sat 
to the problem of like slight inapproximability for three sat. We talked about this in lecture 20, if you want to go back and check that out. And this first reduction is called the PCP theorem. It's a famous theorem. And in fact, that's what we'll talk about in the final lecture. And then there's like another famous theorem called the parallel repetition theorem proved by Raz, which gets you to hardness for a problem called label cover, which we'll talk about later in this class. And then Hostad's contribution was this last piece that involves like a gadget reduction that involves some very cool analysis of Boolean functions. And so this is, you know, one of the longer NP hardness results you'll ever uh, hear about. Okay, so, you know, even though there's like a tremendously long story from 3SAT reducing all the way to Hostad's theorem, you know, for like the practitioner, if you're just a person that, you know, cares about understanding future problems, it's really great to just know this theorem is a black box. I mean, forget how it's proven, but just remember that this problem is NP hard because it's a great starting point for further reductions. I mean, you put that in your pocket, this problem is NP hard, and you put, you know, NP hardness reductions on top of it, and uh, this is a, turns out to be like the great problem for deducing further results about hardness of approximately solving optimization problems. For example, uh, here's just like three out of a very, well, a bunch out of a very huge number of results that are known of this flavor. So starting from Hostad's theorem and adding NP hardness reductions on top of it, you can get the best known NP hardness of approximation factors for max cut, for two sat, for the traveling salesperson problem. Uh, in the metric case, it's known that it's NP hard to approximate it to one plus one over 122 factor. Uh, it's not too impressive, but it's the best thing that's known. It gives you the best known NP hardness approximation for dense case subgraph, non-uniform sparse cut, approximation versions of the graph isomorphism problem. Um, yeah, so this is uh, it's sort of not really like an assumption because we have proven it. Well, it's, it's equivalent to the assumption that P does not equal NP, but it's good to mentally think of it this way as like, okay, this is like a black box I can put in my pocket and try to start deriving future hardness results from. And uh, just to connect it up to the thing we were talking about before, the sparse LPN assumption. What's cool is the sparse LPN assumption. So the Hosan's theorem of this NP hardness theorem, it's like a worst case result that just shows that, you know, for every algorithm, polynomial algorithm that purports to be able to, you know, tell the difference between 99% and 51% satisfiable instances of this 3x RCSP, it's going to get it wrong on at least one instance. The sparse LPN assumption gives you like an efficient way, like a really efficient, simple way to generate hard seeming instances of the, this problem that like seemingly foil all the, you know, um, polynomial time algorithms that we know. Um, because it generates, you know, one minus epsilon uh, satisfiable instances of this 3x or CSP where we don't know any polynomial time algorithm that can, uh, you know, even satisfy 51% of the equations. So therefore, actually, you know, what you can do, if you like, is you can use like the sparse LPN method to randomly generate hard instances of 3XOR, and then you can feed those instances through these polynomial time reductions, and thereby get polynomial time algorithms that efficiently generate random, seemingly hard instances of, you know, TSP and graph isomorphism and all these other problems. Now, a downside is these are not especially natural instances that you'll get out. But, you know, if your friend has like, you know, an algorithm that they claim is real good at solving, you know, approximately solving max cut problems or TSP problems, like in some ways, this is our best known way to test them. It's by like, you know, generating sparse LPN instances and passing them through these polytime reductions. Okay. Now I want to tell you about a related topic, quite related, which is instead of like random three XOR CSPs, I want to talk about like the more famous CSP, 3SAT. And I want to talk to you about um, what's up with 3SAT. What if you want to try to solve this, you know, do the same story with 3SAT? Like if I wanted to say, okay, we know 3SAT is NP hard, but like, please write me a computer program that efficiently generates a hard seeming instance of 3SAT, what would you do? 
Well, one thing you can do is just like choose a purely random instance. And so let me tell you about that. So let's say you fix some number of variables n that you're going to have, and you still have to decide how many clauses you have to have. Like each clause is going to be a random, uh, it's going to be the or of a random collection of three variables, or maybe you'll randomly negate them as well to get literals. But how many clauses will you choose? Well, let's let this be a parameter. Let's let C be a parameter and say that you use C times n clauses. So before we get to the question of like, well, how computationally hard will it be to solve this random 3CNF for satisfiability, let's first ask an, a simpler or a, a more primary question, which is, um, well, is this instance going to be satisfiable or unsatisfiable, or is it going to be 50-50 or what? Like, what will the right answer be? So uh, there's a fact that for this problem, there's a so-called sharp threshold behavior with respect to the sort of the, the number of clauses you choose. In particular, there is a certain constant, alpha 3, uh, which numerically is about 4.2667, but which has like a formal definition. It's like, it's a very painful formal definition. It's like some smallest root of something involving a differential equation that takes half a page to write down. But there is some special number, alpha 3, such that the following is true. If your clause density C is bigger than alpha three, then when you choose a random three set formula with you know, n variables and uh, C times n clauses, it's gonna be unsat with high probability. Okay, and of course, you know, the more clauses you have, the more constrained you know, the instance is, the more likely it is to be unsatisfiable. And conversely, if C is less than this magic number, then uh, with high probability, your instance will be satisfiable. Okay, there's a little asterisk here. I put it here because this is not a theorem, but it is definitely true. Um, people, incredibly enough, in the field of statistical physics have been like thinking about like random instances of CSPs for a really long time. They have an incredibly thorough understanding of them, which is only very hard to analyze mathematically, and only lately have been mathematicians been able to make progress on it. But um, so they know this fact to be true, and it is true, and has recently, sort of recently, been proven to be true, like in a 100-page paper, but only for sufficiently large values of three, <clears throat> by which I mean for random k sat, there's some number alpha k, which comes out of some weird differential equation, such that this theorem is true, but only for sufficiently large k. But it's surely also true for uh, k being three. Okay, so uh, that's just the sort of um, story on like, okay, if you, okay, you fix C to be something and now you generate random three sat instances like this, this sort of will tell you, are they gonna be unsatisfiable or are they gonna be satisfiable? And it depends on if C is big or small. And you know, if you're gonna be generating satisfiable instances, then the appropriate puzzle to give your friend or a, an algorithm is try to find a satisfying assignment. And, they're actually reasonably good algorithms at this. Um, you know, it's easier the fewer constraints there are, so the smaller C is. But for three sat, like we do know efficient satisfying algorithms that with high probability find satisfying assignments. If C is like as large as 3.5, which is not as large as 4.2, but okay, it's something. On the other hand, if you choose like a big value of C so that the random three sat instance is likely to be unsatisfiable, then the appropriate puzzle is to ask the algorithm to find a certificate of unsatisfiability. For example, perhaps it should write down an LP relaxation for like the max 3sat uh, problem on this instance, and it should solve the LP, and you know, maybe the LP value will be 0.99, and that will be a certificate that it's actually unsatisfiable. This seems to be a lot harder. So it's known that if you make a super um, constrained instance where C is at least like root n, so you have n variables and n to the 1.5 clauses, then there are efficient algorithms known that will find certificates of unsatisfiability. And interestingly enough, this uses spectral graph theory, these algorithms. But this is the best thing that's known. So if I give you n variables, random three side instance with n variables and n to the 1.1 clauses, even though it's going to be unsatisfiable with very high probability. We don't know any efficient algorithm that will find a certificate for that fact. And so one can take this as potentially a uh, hardness assumption uh, because people have been working on sad algorithms for a long time. So it's sort of reasonably believable if nobody can solve some problem about random three sad that it might actually be genuinely hard. 
Uh, and then you could try to use it for cryptography purposes or some other purposes. Uh, so this assumption uh, was codified by uh, Uri Feige around 2000, and it's called Feige's hypothesis, or Feige's R3 sat hypothesis. And it says, um, just for seeding any large constant, like 100 or 1,000, if I choose a random 3 sat instance with n variables and c times n clauses, there's no polynomial time algorithm that with high probability finds uh, certificates of unsatisfiability. Uh, okay, so that's Feige's hypothesis up there. Let me just tell you about it. This is one of my favorite hardness hypotheses, by the way. It's a great one to keep in mind. I mean, if you can't prove your problem, it's hard, assuming P does not equal MP, try to assume Feige's hypothesis. So it's actually quite similar to learning parodies with noise. I won't have a chance to say much more about the connections, but they're quite uh, deep connections. And it's basically like a little bit stronger than the learning parodies with noise assumption. One thing about it is it's known to imply many um, strong inapproximability results that we already know how to prove, assuming p does not equal np, but um, in an easy way. So there are many consequences of like Hostad's theorem about hardness of max 3xor um, that are very, well, proving them is a little bit hard and like you have to rely on Hostad's theorem, which has this like 100 page proof. But if you assume Feige's R3 sat hypothesis, then you can prove a lot of these theorems like in like two paragraphs. So that's cool. Um, you know, the conjecture only says that polynomial time algorithms can't do the job, but you might conjecture, it's possible to conjecture that even any sub-exponential time algorithm must also fail. We don't know any like to the little of n time algorithm that solves this task either. And this very powerful algorithmic framework that we talked about in lecture 20, maybe, the sum of squares SDP hierarchy, you can actually prove that it cannot um, you know, solve Feige's three sat, random three sat problem in anything less than like two to the big omega of n time. That's pretty good evidence. And um, you can generalize this also to like random KSAT, where we know that uh, if I give you um, a random KSAT instance that was with like n variables and n to the k over two random clauses, it's known that you can uh, refute satisfiability, like output a certificate of satisfiability with high probability in that case. But if you make m a bit smaller, like n to the 0.01k, one might still um, hypothesis that no polytime algorithm can solve random case at in this case. And this stronger assumption is also known to have like cool consequences, especially for hardness of learning. So Daniele and Shalov Schwartz showed that under this assumption, you can prove that it's hard to learn DNF formulas, pack learn them, which was a pretty notable open problem. They also showed that it's hard to learn house spaces like linear classifiers with agnostic noise, so in a hard noise model and so forth. So these are examples of like hardness results about learning that we don't know how to prove just assuming p does not equal np, but we do know how to prove now um, if you make Feige's uh, hypothesis.